So I was listening to the ABC song the other day, and everything I've listened to since just seems so derivative. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. <clears throat> okay, so what we have in Psalm 34, if you've brought your Bibles, Psalm 34 is an ABC psalm. It's another one of those acrostic psalms, 22 verses in the Hebrew alphabet, and at each line, 22 lines, begins with a different verse in succeeding order. And so it's an ABC song, and it's an ABC song for a time of crisis, for a time of trial and difficulty. Um, and if you'll look at the superscript, there is... In the Psalter, 14 psalms that uh, come with a, a title, a superscription, um, something relating or linking to the life of David. And a lot of them don't fit. They don't work. Uh, but this one does. So we'll see what it says. Um, right before the, the psalm begins, of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. Um, these were added by an editor sometime later. I read the commentators. They don't even comment on these. They don't consider them to be scripture. Um, but this one gives us a clue, and the clue takes us back to 1 Samuel chapter 21. Uh, if you've got a pew Bible, you'll find that on page 244. And this is the words of Samuel describing what took place. Now, you'll hear a different name, Abimelech in the title, Abimelech in the psalm, but that's the title of the king of the Philistines in Gath. You can find that in Genesis 20, verse 2, 26, verse 8. Um, but his name was Ashish, and that's who Samuel refers to him as here in 1 uh, Samuel chapter 21. And David rose and fled that day from Saul, and he went to Ashish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Ashish said to him, Is not this David, the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Ashish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them, and he pretended to be insane in their hands, and he made marks on the doors or of the gate and let the spittle run down his beard. And then Ashish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I, look, do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? And so David left and he fled to the cave of Adullam. And so commentators believe that that's where he sat down and he wrote this psalm. Now, if we are to read Samuel and read the narrative of this event and these things that happened, we would come to the conclusion probably that... Um, David escaped because of his own guile, because of his own wiliness, his scheming. He pretended to be mad, but he wasn't mad. A lot of commentators make much of this, that um, this was a bad day for David. David was a loser. He was clearly not trusting the Lord to deliver him. He had no faith. And so here's what we do when we have no faith. We come up with plans of our own. Um, and I, I get what they're saying. However, that isn't David's testimony. So now if we go back to Psalm 34, David's testimony is completely different. As he sits in the cave of Adullam and he reflects on his experience in Gath and reflects on how God met him there and how God acted on his behalf and what God did when David called out to him. His testimony is that I was a man undone. I was greatly afraid. I was at my wit's end. I was, in the words of verse 18, crushed in spirit. I was broken hearted. David, at this point in his life, he wasn't a warlord. He didn't have his mighty men. He wasn't the king of Israel. Saul was the king of Israel. He was just the shepherd boy who had been playing for Saul in his court, and he has no one. He has no resources. He has no prestige, no power, no wealth, no influence, and he is at the end of his tether. This is a person who has nothing. So when he cries out to God, it's either God or nothing. And he, his experience, his testimony is that when I cried out, 
God was there. God answered me. And so we have a two-part uh, the way that God works, the way that God answers prayer in this psalm and in many of the other psalms that attest to this is the way that God works. First, that God hears and God answers. David cried out to God and God heard him and God answered him. Um, it's similar to the Aaronic blessing, Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, A-A-R-O-N, um, not ironic, okay? Ironic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. When you are in the presence of God and you are at the end of the tether, at the end of the line, and you call out to him and you know that he has heard you, when you have been in his presence, you lighten, you stand up straighter, you're countenance changes and that you have hope and joy and a restoration of life. And this is what David is giving testimony to. He cried out at the end of the line and God was there and God heard him and God answered him. The Apostle John puts it this way in 1 John chapter 5 verses 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have before him, before God, that when we pray according to his will, we could ask anything and because we ask, we know that he has heard us. Because we ask, we know that he has heard us, and because he has heard us, he will give us that for which we have asked. That's David's testimony. That's John's testimony. This is the testimony of the people of God. God hears, and then God answers. And then there's another part to this. When God answers, he rescues and he delivers. Two parts to this. He rescues and he delivers. Again, this was David's experience in, the, 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 in Gath with the king uh, Abimelech. This was what happened to David. He cried out, God heard, God answered. And here's how it worked. It's as if, not necessarily in this particular case that this is what happened, but it's as if God turns to the angel in charge of the heavenly hosts and he gives the signal. And the angel, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And the angel takes the host and they surround David so that Abimelech and his hordes cannot touch David. Circumstances and difficulties no longer have access to the intended victim, and they have him surrounded so that he is safe in God's care. God rescues and God delivers. Billy Graham, in his book about angels, said that this is exactly uh, a ministry of the angels, and then he gives an example from church history. Reverend John G. Patton, was a missionary to the New Hebrides Islands, and it was populated by savages and cannibals, and he was taking the good news to them. He had, de he had developed a, a missionary encampment, and he had a headquarters, a building, uh, and he and his wife were living in it. One night, their encampment was surrounded by a tribe of these savages who intended to burn them out of their building and then slay them as they tried to run away. And so, John and his wife got down on their knees and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed for deliverance and they prayed for rescue and they prayed for salvation and they prayed and they prayed. And in the morning, as the sun began to come up, the tribe of savages slowly backed away and evaporated into the forest and they were delivered. And so they gave praise to God and they were delivered. About a year later, the chief of this tribe came to faith in Christ and so John sat down with him and asked him about that night. What happened on that night? And the, the chief of the tribe said, well, um, we intended to burn you out and kill you, but um, who were all those men you had with you? And Patton said, there were no men. It was just my wife and I. Oh, no, no, the chief said. There were hundreds of very large men in shining garments with drawn swords, and they surrounded you so that we were not able to get at you at all. And we gave up in the morning and we left. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Now, hallelujah, amen. And so this is David's testimony. God listens 
and he answers. God rescues and God delivers. Now, what we're reading is wisdom literature. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, it's wisdom literature. And there are certain words that are code words in wisdom literature. Um, in our text this morning, we have the righteous. Well, the righteous are those who fear the Lord. And in wisdom literature, we saw it last week, um, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We hear this in the Psalms, we hear it in the Proverbs, and fear is an unfortunate translation because fear makes it sound like we go to a horror movie to see, to be afraid. I don't really get into those movies, I don't really get the psychology of that, but people just love to go to the movies to get scared. And so to say that we fear God is that God is a horror or that God is somehow terrible. Now, he is that to his enemies, but he's not to the righteous, to those who fear him. A better word is awe. Why? Because our God is awesome. He's awesome. And so we love him, and we respect him, and we reverence him. And so the righteous are those who have respect for and reverence God, and part of the way that that shows itself is that they att attempt to lead a life pleasing to him walking in his footsteps and bearing fruit in every good work, that they try to do that. Jesus says in John 14, 21, he who loves me keeps my commandments. It's not that that saves us, but that this is a way that we demonstrate our love, response, our awe, our respect for God by trying to live according to his ways. Now, another code word, those who hate the righteous, at least in our psalm, they're called the wicked. And the wicked hate the righteous and they do evil. Um, and so we, we understand there's a dynamic, there's a conflict, there's a contrast being made here in this passage. And so we will, uh, we will look at that. <sighs> to the wicked, God issues threats. God will not be mocked. God will not allow the, the righteous to suffer unnecessarily at the hands of the wicked, those who hate the righteous. And so uh, he makes a couple of threats. Look at verse 16. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. If you won't walk in God's ways and you don't have reverence and respect for God, then he will take take away your legacy, take away your heritage, and he will wipe away your name. And then it gets worse, verse 21. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous, they will be condemned. When we get to the end of the psalm, it's not just... David talking about his lessons that he learned in Gath, but also it's the ultimate questions. It's about life and death and what happens at death. And here we see at the end of the psalm that God promises that those who are wicked, they will experience condemnation. They will experience the wrath of God. And so I don't want to sugarcoat it for you. That's what it says. That's what these are the threats that he breathes. Now, God, you'll notice, is mentioned in almost every, every verse of our passage. And it's not just God, it is the Lord. And I said last week, you'll see it in small caps. That means it's God's covenant name. It's Yahweh, God's, um, God's relational name, his personal name. You'll see it in verse 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and then again down in verse 22. Six times, double, triple repetition. This is who our God is. He is a God of hesed. He is a God of steadfast love. He is a God of covenant-keeping kindness and mercy, covenant-keeping faithfulness. This is the God with whom we deal. And so God makes deals with the righteous. He makes covenants with them. God um, makes promises, and so he backs them up. And so there are five promises in our text that God makes to the righteous. Now, I'm asked from time to time, how do I remember the stuff that I say when I'm up here? And I have little mnemonic devices that I come up with. So if you want to write the letters down, and then I'll see if I can remember what they stand for. C D. P-P-J-G. There are five promises. C-D-P-P-J-G. J-G is fifth, and those two go together. So the first one is, and the other little device that I use, the first two begin with the odd numbers, and then they switch to the even numbers in the last three. So I'm, I'm trying to remember this stuff while I'm up here drooling down my chin. Okay, so... 
The first one is C, care. And notice in verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. His eyes and his ears that God is involved with and God cares for his people, for those who are his servants. His eyes are looking for them, or as the chronicler says, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to strongly support those whose heart is completely his. And Jesus is constantly listening for the cries of his servants, for the cries of his people. His eyes and his ears are attuned to them. And we see this in the life of Jesus. He's in the temple, not in the temple, he's in the, in the synagogue, and it's crowded because he's, he's famous, and so they're packing in. And there's a woman standing in the back. She can't even get a seat, and she's bent over at the waist because she has a demon, and she hasn't been able to stand up straight in years. And out of that entire populace of the synagogue, there's a crush of people. Who does Jesus see? He sees the one that's hurting. He sees the one that's suffering. That's what his eyes are attuned to. That's who he looks at. He answered David's prayers because David was not a person of power and wealth and influence. David was at the end of any natural resource that he could bring to bear on his circumstances and situations, so he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord answered him. I love Carol's children's times because she got the nub of it. I don't know why I'm up here. When Alexander has a very bad, lousy, crummy, horrible, bad day, whatever the name of that book is, and we've all had them, that's when Jesus is tuned in and he hears our cries. When we call out to him, that's when he hears us. So C and then D. So verse 17. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and he, D, delivers them. He delivers them from their troubles, from their trials, from their circumstances. These are the promises that God is making. These are the lessons that David learned in the school of hard knocks. You know, we don't like the school of hard knocks. We would prefer to read about it in a book and learn it and, and then move on and avoid all the troubles, the trials, the difficulties. But that's not how God works. It's in those problems. It's in that pain that God is working on us. It's, that's what God is doing, and he's changing us, and he's breaking us, and he's making us into new people. Um, the first P is, uh, go to the even verses, verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. It's when we are broken on the inside. It's when our spirit is crushed that that's when God is actually doing his thing and working on us and in us and through us. As David sits in the cave of Adullam and he considers what his experience in Gath, it wasn't because he was wily and crafty that he got out of that. It's because he cried out to God and God heard him and God answered him. And God did that because David had nowhere else to go. He had no other means of salvation, no other means of escape, so he cried out to God. Have you ever been in a circumstance or situation when you were broken inside, when you were crushed in spirit? It's been about 25 years ago now, but Cheryl and I, our marriage cratered, and we were separated, and I was just crushed, literally. I cried every day for two years, every day. I was brokenhearted. And I cried out to God, and God in his mercy delivered me. Now, I'll tell you this also. It is the best thing that ever happened to you that I went through that. <laughs> because prior to that experience, I had all the answers. You do A, B, and C, and God will do D, E, and F, and your, your life is crap. Well, that's because you did this, this, and this. I was like one of Job's counselors. I would have been horrible. But because of that, I have learned a little bit about empathy and compassion a little bit. Um, I've made a little bit of progress in this life. But, but I cried out when I was crushed. I cried out when I was brokenhearted. And God delivered me. And we're married. And she's right here. And she loves me. Well, she can tell you about that later. And, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and here we are. Have you ever been in that experience in that set of circumstances when there's nothing left, 
I went from 200 pounds to 148 pounds. My clothes didn't fit. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I was just utterly crushed and cried out. And God heard and God answered and God delivered because that's who God is. And those are the people who God hears. So when you're down and out and when you're beat to pieces, it doesn't mean that God has turned his back on you. When are we most likely to conclude that God has turned his back on us? It's when we're going through those times. It's when things are hard. Oh, God isn't here. God isn't hearing me. Where is he? Carol shared it this morning with the children's time, the, the poem about he carried me, the footprints. Remember on the day of resurrection, on Easter Sunday, Mary comes to the tomb. And she can see the tomb has been fiddled with. The rock is gone. And she looks in and there's no Jesus. And she sees a guy supposing him to be the gardener and says to him, where, where have they laid him? My Lord is gone. What's going on here? She's crushed. She's broken hearted. And the gardener, Jesus, Jesus says to her, Mary, and as soon as she heard her name in his voice, she knew immediately that he'd been there all the time. Why didn't she see him? Her eyes were filled with tears. When our eyes are full of tears, we, everything is blurry. Everything doesn't look the way that it ought to look. And so we, we conclude, because we can't see that God is right there present with us, that he's not there at all. And we conclude that God, God doesn't care. But he was there all along. And so we have to say along with David, though my eyes deceive me and though I can't see you, I know that you are near, what does it say in verse 18? Here is the promise. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and he saves the crushed in spirit. It's when we are having those experiences, the word of God attests to us and promises to us and God promises to us that that's when he is near and that's when he is there alongside us and with us. And though we don't want to go through those experiences, God uses them. So C, D, P, P, so he is present, and then verse 20. It's the next positive, or uh, thank you, dear. Next even verse. I love you. Verse 20. He keeps all his bones, and none of them are broken. She's back. I'm going to be good now. <laughs> he protects us. It's a promise of protection, and I'll come back to the significance of that particular promise a little bit later. And then J.G., justifying grace, verse 22, the next even verse, thank you, dear. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. So David is speaking about his current set of circumstances. He was redeemed from them. He was saved from them. He was not utterly condemned. They didn't get his hands on him and kill him or sell him to Saul who would have killed him if he could have gotten his hands on him. And we see God at work in this. We see the maturity of David developing. Prior to this, he was a callow youth that played the lyre and sang in the court for Saul to calm his nerves. And he really didn't have much going on. And he didn't have wealth, power, prestige, all of those things. Just an ordinary guy. And he now begins to grapple with, in his early years, ultimate questions. Ultimate questions about life and death and what happens at death and what happens at the end of life. And these verses at the end of the psalm are expressions of those things. The wicked are condemned. The wicked don't get any safety, salvation, rescue, deliverance. God is not mocked, says Paul in Galatians. Whatever a man sows, so also shall he reap. And they will reap what they have sown. But for the righteous... And here is the promise, the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of what David is talking about. We take the trajectory to where it is going is that we were redeemed. How? In the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. We were redeemed from sin. We were redeemed from death. We were rescued from those things, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We were rescued from all of those things. And then how does it conclude in the second half of the verse? That we are not condemned. 
It's what Paul says in Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The ultimate fulfillment of David's experience of rescue and deliverance is salvation. Salvation for, from sin and an eternity in relationship with God where we don't need to worry because God keeps all of his promises. He cares and he delivers and he is present and he, what's the other P? He protects us. Thank you, dear. So I'm telling you, she's back in the saddle. I love it. Because <laughs> I'm, having, I'm having difficulty remembering things, so this is good. Anyway, um, now this psalm is quoted twice in the New Testament. Um, its outline is very simple. I'm doing this at the end rather than the beginning. The first 10 verses, 1 through 10, they are a invitation to and then reasons to give praise to God. And that's the more famous portion of this psalm. People read the first 10 verses and kind of tune out the rest, taste and see that the Lord is good. We, we know some of these verses and we remember some of these verses. And then in the last 12 verses, 11 through 22, uh, it's a sermon. And so it is um, instructions on how to live a godly life. So our passage are instructions to us, it's wisdom literature, instructions to us on how to live a godly life. And in verses 16 through 22, uh, Peter quotes these verses in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. As he's exhorting the church, as he's giving instructions to Christians on how to live a godly life, he's quoting David and the lessons that David learned in the cave of Adullam, and he's quoting this psalm in the New Testament. And the other quote is, and you recognized it when I read it, verse 20, none of his bones will be broken. John, in John chapter 19, verse 36, at the end of the Passion, when Jesus has died on the cross, the Roman centurion takes the spear and thrusts it into Jesus' side. He realizes that Jesus is dead, and so now there is no need for him to break Jesus' legs to hasten the death of Jesus. He's already dead and gone, so I don't need to do this. We also see in verse 20 uh, what is called prophetic perspective. David didn't foresee Jesus on the cross, probably didn't see, I mean, I don't know what he saw, but probably didn't see Jesus on the cross when he composed the psalm and sang this song. What he did was affirm his own experience of his escape from Gath, and they didn't throw rocks at him and beat him with sticks and break any of his bones. That's what he's referring to. But John sees in this 2,000 years later a fulfillment of a messianic prophecy. And John says so in John 19, verse 36. He says that the word of God, that this prophecy might be fulfilled in Jesus, that the Romans didn't break the legs of Jesus. And so we see that it's got a present in the time and space fulfillment uh, in the life of David, but that God spoke it with something else in mind further down the road. It's called prophetic perspective. And we see it at work that this David was preserved and the son of David, Jesus, was preserved in the same way and that it's a fulfillment. So what's the lesson that David's trying to teach us? In the midst of our trials and our pain and our anguish, Anguish, it's real, like the patents, terrifying, objective, fears. These savages could come in and literally kill us. That's, that was David's experience. But it could also be interior, subjective terrors, anxiety of things. We get a diagnosis of cancer or one of our children is sick or whatever that might be. That when we have no other recourse, and isn't it always the truth that we have when there are other things to try, David tried madness. When there are other things to try, we'll do anything rather than call out, cry out. It's when we've tried everything else, finally when we're at the end, that's when we cry out, that's when we pray. And when we cry out and pray, the Lord is close. The Lord is near. His eyes are attuned to your suffering. He sees what's going on, your circumstances, and his ears is are attuned to your cry as you plead and call out for help. He's as near as standing next to you. And so in the midst of those difficulties in life, you cry out and he listens 
and he answers, and he rescues, and he delivers. That's what David learned. That's what we need to hear as well. Amen.